You may be seated. What a beautiful day. Amen? Amen. God is so good. So grateful for that time this morning. Thank you, Will and Sarah and Ez and Alan, who came and was on percussions this morning. Thank you. Amen. So what a privilege and an honor to be here together, 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 together in the name of our Lord. And uh, just so grateful for the opportunity to be with you. And I, I'm not just saying that. I don't take it lightly. It is a privilege and an honor to be in fellowship with you. I just love your hearts and, and just so encouraged by just what God is doing. Um, and we just want to cooperate with him, right? And so this morning we had planned for Javier and Shannon Lampador to be here and they were going to speak. We're going to, we were, they were going to continue in our Colossians series and they were going to speak on relationships. And we're going to hear that. We're going to hear from them. Um, but it was unavoidable and they could not come this weekend. And so I was talking to Javier the other day and we're, we're looking at a couple of weeks, probably in October. So we're not going to let it go too long. We're going to get them up here. And we're excited about that. And so whenever you're kind of throwing a curveball during the week, right, you, you, uh, you have one of two options. You can freak out or you can be like, you know what? God is in this. And my life verse, at least for the past decade or so, has been uh, Proverbs 16, 9. And it says, a man plans his way in his heart but the Lord directs his steps. And so when I was speaking with Javier and uh, I realized that he wasn't coming this weekend, I was like, okay, God, what do you want me to share this weekend? And I just really felt strongly uh, that, that we needed to pause the Colossian series for, for just a bit. I want us as a church to focus on this topic of prayer. And I thought this is so timely for multiple reasons. Uh, we, uh, those of you who are in a rooted group, uh, we've got a couple of rooted groups right now. You'll know that in this past week or two, we're actually in the second week of focusing on the topic of communicating with God and the importance of prayer in the life of the follower of Jesus. And whether you're a mature Christian or you're a baby Christian, it's so important for us to be reminded of the power of prayer. So this has really been on my heart and on my mind. And, and this past week, one of our Ruta groups, we had a, a prayer experience. We had a time together where we gathered and we just prayed for an hour. And then we broke our fast together. And we're going to do the same with, the next, uh, with another Ruta group this coming week. Um, and I just want to encourage you. Let me just do a public service announcement. Let me do a little plug. If you're not in a Ruta group next semester when we launch some more Ruta groups, I want to encourage you to get in a Ruta group. It's basically a small um, community group of discipleship and conversation and encouraging one another and, uh, you know, just setting aside 10 weeks of your life. I'm going to go on a journey for 10 weeks with some other believers and uh, it's been a real blessing. But we've been in this topic of prayer, and, and I just wanted to share with the entire church because I think we're, I, it, this is so important right now. I think we're 48 days from an election. 48 days in which local officials and state officials and national officials and our presidency will be determined. We need to pray. We need to pray. And by the way, I, I'm not a uh, person who believes that the answer for our nation is a political answer. But at the same time, I want to pray that God puts the right people in authority who are going to be making decisions over the next several years. So I want to trust him with that. We need to press in and prayer. We need to pray because we're in the middle of uh, a pandemic and we're, we're I don't think we're at month six now or something like that. And we're trying to navigate that. And are we going to get moved from purple to red so we can meet inside? And it's like, I, I, I've never, I never thought I'd be praying for colors, you know? 
and I was telling somebody this this past week. It's like um, I I catch myself praying that that our 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 county gets moved from the category of purple to this per this category of red. And and what's interesting is I don't necessarily even agree with the standards that define purple and red and all that stuff, but whatever, I want us to gather inside and I want more of us to be able to gather together and they feel comfortable doing that. So, so I'm praying for that. We need to pray for that. And we need to pray for a church and we need to pray for one another. So I thought what an important topic prayer. And again, if you've been serving the Lord for many, many years, man, you've probably heard dozens and dozens of amazing service sermons on prayer. I'm not going to try to wow you this morning with any break, you know, new breaking ground on, on, on prayer. But my goal this morning is that you would be inspired to go deeper in your prayer walk. Wherever you're at in your prayer life, my goal this morning is to simply that we would all be inspired to pray more. It will transform your life. There's power in prayer. And that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. So the text, there's many, many amazing texts that we could go to on, on prayer. But I want us to go to James chapter 5, and we're going to be starting in verse 13. James chapter 5 and verse 13 and, and following. And I'm going to be reading out of the ESV, if you're looking online or you're following along on your Bible app, or if you're here on this beautiful morning in the shade, uh, it's on the back of your bulletin or inside your bulletin. And it says this, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So I, th that right there, I could stop right there. Uh, we sang about that just a few moments ago. Whether you're in the valley or on the mountaintop, whether you're in the valley or that, our perspective towards God, our approach towards God should not change based on our circumstance. We should always run to God, whether we're on the mountaintop or in the valley. But is any one of you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The power of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I love that. It doesn't say, uh, it doesn't say the prayer of a righteous person has great power when it is working. Or if it is working, it says the power of the righteous person has great power as it is working. You see, the assumption is that prayer works, that there's power in it. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So this morning, like I said, I'm not going to try to wow you. I just want to inspire you and encourage you to go deeper in your walk and in your journey and maybe get you to think about prayer um, in a fresh way. And this morning, I just want us to focus on a, focus on a couple of things. And, and uh, if you're taking notes at the risk of having a cliche three-part sermon, I didn't plan it that way. It's just how it unfolds. Um, but I want to talk about the call for us to pray. The call for prayer. And I want to talk about the power that's in prayer. And I want to talk to us and I want to encourage us in the practice of prayer. So the call for prayer, the power in prayer and the practice of prayer. So first off, the, the, the call for prayer. If you'll notice right in the passage, we are called to pray. We are called to approach God in Every circumstance, every circumstance, suffering. It says, is any one of you suffering? Let him, let him pray. Suffering has a wide 
range of situations that that covers, right? It could be physical suffering. It could be financial suffering. It could be emotional suffering. It could be relational suffering. It could be uh, persecution in the workplace. It could be challenges with the people in your life that you love dearly, but it's challenging at times. So whatever the case, whatever is causing you difficulty, whatever is causing suffering in your life, we are called to pray. And I know it's like, well, of course, yes, I'm a believer. I'm a follower of Jesus. Of course, of course we would pray. But is it our first response? We know that we're called to pray when we encounter challenges, when we encounter things in our life. We know that that's available to us and we know that we're called to pray. But is that our first response? Or when you're Dealing with difficulty is our first response sometimes to complain about it to someone else. So we're suffering. We got something going on. And, and, and what's my first response? Am I, am I going to vent to someone else? Am I going to, am I going to worry? Is that my first response? Am I going to worry first and then later go, oh yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to pray. But I'm suffering, so am I going to get stressed out? Is that my first response? Am I going to complain? Am I, going to, am I going to vent? Am I going to fill in the blank? What is your first response? You're called to pray. If you're having difficulty, that should be our knee-jerk reaction. That should be the first thing that we do. Because we are invited to bring God into our situation. You know, I, I don't, I'm not saying you shouldn't process something with somebody close to you. Like, I am grateful for close friends in my life that I can process things with. I'm grateful for that. And that's, that can be very helpful when I'm going through difficulty and when I'm suffering. And it could be very helpful if I can go uh, to people. In fact, Javier, my friend who's, who was supposed to be here, um, he's one of those people that I process stuff with. And I'm grateful for that. But that should not be my first response because even though my friend who I invite into my situation, who I invite into my suffering, even though it may be helpful for them to be a listening ear and to help me process, you know, chances are they really don't have the power to do anything about my situation. So I should go to God. I should, I should, I should press into God because he's got the solution. He's got the answer for whatever I'm facing. So we are called to pray when we're suffering. And if you notice, then it says, uh, is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So, so when I'm in the valley and I'm suffering, I, I'm called to pray. But when I'm cheerful, when things are going really, really well, guess what? I'm supposed to bring God into that situation also. And I know it says, let him sing praise. But this whole passage the context is instruction on prayer. So this doesn't say, when things are going bad, talk to God. But things are, when things are going good, make sure you go to church and worship. You see, praise and prayer are intertwined. You, you know you can praise God in your prayer. Praising God isn't just what we did this morning. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for people who are talented musicianally. I'm not. I love to worship, but I can't sing. And I can't play an instrument. I love to worship. And I'm grateful for the opportunities that we have to get together to praise. But you can praise God in your prayer. And we're going to see that in a little bit when we talk about the practice of prayer. We're going we're gonna to see the importance of incorporating praise, that we don't just come to God when we're suffering and we have a need, but that we, when we're coming to God in prayer, that there is, a, there is a part of that that I am lifting up God and I'm praising Him in my prayer. And then it goes on to say, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. So, so suffering is mentioned already, but then sickness is specifically mentioned. Can I just say it is absolutely biblical 
to ask God for healing. Now, my father-in-law, Bob, who's probably watching this morning, he's a retired physician. My, my mother-in-law, she's a retired RN. I'm absolutely grateful for people in the medical field, and they are heroes, and people that go through all of that training to learn the complexity of the human body and how amazing it is, and then, and then medicine and technology that can help. I'm all for that. But you know what we're seeing right here is that, yes, medicine, yes, absolutely. But, but are we inviting God into this situation? Are we asking him for healing? Are we asking for people to pray over us, anoint us? And, and, and are we even doing that? Are we even doing that as Christians? You see, we, we, we profess faith in Jesus Christ. We profess believing that actually somebody rose from the dead. That's the whole basis of our faith, that Jesus rose from the dead. We believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. These are unbelievable miracles that actually are the bedrock of our faith that define uh, so much of our theology and our philosophy and how we live our life. So, so, so why can we not believe that God can heal my cold? that God could even heal cancer. I know of cases where people have been healed of diseases like cancer. I also know of people who have been healed through the process of medicine as well. But are we inviting God into the situation? That's the call of prayer. We are called as followers of Jesus to invite God into our situation. And it goes on to say, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now, let me just say something right here about this. There are times where I have heard, uh, and this is, this is so dejecting and I, I think it can be so discouraging at times, but I have heard of situations in which people have been praying for healing and they've not received it. And other well-meaning Christians, they, they mean well, they, they, they say, well, you just don't have enough faith because there is a link between faith and prayer. We see it all throughout scriptures, okay? But well-meaning people can sometimes talk about, well, if you haven't experienced healing yet, you know, maybe you just don't, maybe you just need to grow your faith. What's interesting about this particular passage where it says, and the prayer of faith, well, it says, let them pray over him, anointing him in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Guess what? The prayer that is mentioned here is referring back to the subject of the people that were invited to come in to pray. It's not the faith of the sick person. In this passage, it says the prayer, which means the people who've been called in to pray, it's their faith that will be effective. And so, I, I mean, I just want to encourage you. Yes, there is a link between our faith and the effectiveness of prayer. Absolutely. But sometimes when you're sick, sometimes when you're down, sometimes when the world is against you, it's, it's hard. Your faith is beat up. And sometimes it's hard to just rally your faith, even though you, you're, you're, not shake, you're not shaken in your roots in Christ, but sometimes it's just hard if you've gone through a situation or you're sick, especially for a, an extended season, it's hard to rally your faith. And that's why it's saying, hey, call for other people. Invite other people. It's the faith of their prayers. Now, I believe that people have faith in different measures, in different, in different seasons, and in different areas. Now, for me, like, I, I want to pray for anybody who's ever struggled with addiction. I have a tremendous amount of faith. I can't say that I, I know for sure that I've um, prayed for... Uh, anyone on a consistent basis to be miraculously healed and they've, they've been healed. I have, I have experienced in Uganda being, people, being delivered of, of demonic oppression, but it's not something that 
I pray for regularly. And, but I have a measure of faith because I've seen it. I have seen people delivered oh, because of prayer. I've experienced it. So I have a measure of faith. But I have a whole lot of faith when it comes to addiction because I myself was in bondage of, of addiction for many years. And I, I, I was, drugs had a complete control on me and I was powerless to do anything about it. And God delivered me from that. I've seen it. I've lived it. I'm confident. I have a tremendous amount of faith. Anybody comes to me, I, I want to pray for you. You're struggling with addiction. Come to me. I am full of faith. I know that I know that I know that I know that God can intervene in that. So surround yourself by people full of faith. When you're going through something, when you're, when you're faced up against a diagnosis that seems um, uh, uh, overwhelming or you're suffering in a particular area, invite people in to partner with you and pray over you in faith. That's the call to prayer. That's the call. And there's power in that. Look at this, what it says. And the Lord will raise him up. And here's what's interesting as well. This word sick has a different meaning than the sentence right before it. It says um, in verse 14, it says, Is any of you, any, anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. That word sick right there in the Greek is exactly the way we would understand sick. It's illness, it's infirmary, it's lack of health, okay? It is physical sickness, lack of physical health. The next verse says, and the prayer of faith will save anyone who is sick. That Greek word is a different word. And I know it's confusing, because you're like, come on. Now, now how many here are bilingual? Uh, Spanish to English, right? Okay, so... Um, you know that Google Translate doesn't always get it right. Like Alma and I were having fun this, this, over this past week. We were texting back and forth, and she, she threw something out, and I went to Google Translate. And, uh, and I was like, and then I, I said something back to her, and then she said something back to me, and I'm like, okay, Google, Google got that wrong. So, so there, are, there are many words that have nuances, especially in a complex language like Greek. And we have it in English, too. The word rock. You can say rock, you can say stone, you can say pebble, you can say boulder. So there's many, many words. So in this case, I know I'm kind of geeking out on you, and I'm sorry, but this is fascinating to me. So in the first verse, it says, is any one of you physically sick? But in this verse, it says, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. This word sick right now expands to include emotions, mental, spiritual, and physical health. The lack of those. So, so the whole idea is, um, the, the Greek word there for sick literally means exhausted or lack from overwork. Like it's, it's a, it's a I'm, I'm physically impacted because the weight of this situation has overwhelmed me. And it can include uh, physical. But it's interesting that it talks about somebody who is mentally needs God to intervene. Somebody who is emotionally drained and needs God to encourage them. Somebody who has a spiritual deficit inside. So it's what this, this opportunity uh, creates is no matter what type of sickness I have, no matter, no matter what type of lack I'm experiencing, that, that the prayer of faith, inviting people in, can heal that situation. God can work through that prayer and heal you. So I'm a big fan of praying. I'm a big believer that we, we need to pray more. And, and I want us to become a, a culture as a church where we are not um, intimidated to come and ask one another for prayer. 
that it becomes commonplace that in our services that we that we come forward for prayer that people aren't going to look at people going wow what's your problem because we are called to pray and there's power in prayer there's, pro- there's power in prayer. Um, there's power for healing. We see that in James 5.14. There's power in deliverance of any situation that you need to be delivered in. We see that in Psalm 107.28. In fact, I'm going to turn there. I wasn't planning on doing this, but I, I love this. It, it, this is talking about people who are in distress. Anybody ever been in distress? Just a few of you. Well, we'll partner with somebody who's, who has been in distress and, and try to figure out what it feels like, okay? But, but the people who have been in distress, look what it says. I'm, I'm sorry, you don't have it in front of you, but in Psalm 107 and verse 28 it says, they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He delivered them. So we see there's power in prayer to heal. We see there's power in prayer to deliver you from your trouble. Whatever trouble you're facing, there is power in prayer. Um, There is wisdom that is the result of prayer. We see that in James chapter 1 in verses 5 and 6. There is wisdom. You need wisdom? Pray. God says that if you pray and ask for wisdom, he will get it. Provision. John 16, 24, uh, 23. Has anybody ever needed provision? Favor in a job? Financial resource? Somebody to come alongside and help when you really need it? John 16. Let me read this. John 16, 23. It says, In that day you will ask nothing of me. It's talking about the day when we're in the presence of God. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. That says that's, that's anything. So you need something from God, and, and we're going to talk about what it means to ask in his name in just a moment. But anything, you need provision, we're called to go to God in prayer because there's power for him to provide through prayer. And he will give it to you, verse 24, until now... You've asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be full. So we have healing. We have deliverance. We have uh, the power of provision. Uh, we have wisdom, uh, peace. Last week, we looked at uh, Philippians uh, chapter four and where it says, be anxious about nothing, but in all things pray. And God will give you peace. So you need peace. You are in emotional distress. There is power in prayer to handle that for you. God works through prayer. Forgiveness. Wow. That's interesting. It says right here in verse uh, 15, it says, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And again, that's all sorts of sickness, emotional, mental, physical, spiritual, And the Lord will raise him up. And if he's committed sins, he will be forgiven. Did you know that the power of being being forgiven comes through prayer? So we know that we're forgiven because of the blood of Jesus, right? We know that. The provision to be forgiven is there. What do we have to do to be forgiven? Does it just automatically happen? Now we have to ask for forgiveness. There's power for forgiveness in prayer. There's so much power. And and what's interesting is, then I I love the fact that it goes right on and says this, the the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. We are called to pray. We are called to invite God into every situation And there's great power in prayer. But here's where I think some of us, there's a hiccup. There's a challenge right here. And it's like, well, okay, I believe that God invites me to pray. I believe that there's power in prayer. But is God really going to answer my prayer? And then you encounter a verse like this where it says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. It's working. And then, we sometimes in our human nature go, well, see, there it is right there. 
You know, God answers the prayers of the righteous people. And it's like, okay, somehow there's this category of people in which God answers their prayers, and then there's me. And I believe in prayer, and I believe in its power, but is he really going to answer my prayers? And then they throw in, then it's almost like to make matters worse, then they start talking about Elijah. And you're like, of course God's going to answer Elijah's prayer. Of course, I'm no Elijah. You know what I love about this? Is that the author of James, who knows the Hebrew scriptures, who knows the stories of the Old Testament inside and out, picks Elijah. Because it's just the opposite of what our natural tendency is. Our natural tendency is like, I could never relate to somebody like Elijah. But the author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, specifically picks Elijah because we all should be able to relate to him. And you're like, well, what are you talking about? This that goes on to say, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. A nature like ours. And you're like, yeah, right. I'm no Elijah. He prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore fruit. You know what's interesting about this? This is referring to this epic story in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18. And if you've been a follower of Jesus for, for uh, you know, maybe all your life, you've probably heard these stories in Sunday school, or you've heard these sermons preached on what happened in these couple of chapters. It's pretty amazing. So what happens is Elijah is a man of God, and um, a new king comes on the scene. So at that time, Israel was divided up in the southern kingdom, which was Judea, and the northern kingdom, which was Israel. And so they each had different kings at different times. And in the northern kingdom of Israel, there's a king that comes on the scene by the name of Ahab. And the Bible describes Ahab as the most wicked king there had ever been. It said all of the others combined didn't equal his wickedness. He, it was amazing, amazingly bad. He was an evil, evil person. And, he, and, and what does he do as, in, in, as the king of a nation that's built on the worship of Yahweh? What does he do? He starts building altars to Baal. He starts worshiping Baal and he sets up all of these, these places of worship and he gets all these prophets of this false god. And, and Asherah, another god, and he, and he gets all these other prophets. And he's just a wicked king. And so God prophetically through, through Elijah says, you know what, we're going we're gonna to get the attention of people who have turned their back on God and we're going to um, we're gonna demonstrate the sovereignty and the power of God. And Elijah prays and there's a drought. And this is where maybe in Sunday school, you remember the story where, where Elijah take, goes out into the wilderness and he lives by a creek and he gets his food from, from ravens and he, he camps out there for a long, long time. And he does some pretty amazing things. God redirects him and he goes uh, and he moves to another location and he runs into a widow and she's about to, uh, she's about to bake her last loaf of bread with her, with her, with her son. And, and she just is, cause it's a man, man, there's a famine in the land and, 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 and they're going to, and she's like, we're just going to die. And, and Elijah says, no, you're not going to die because your, your oil's not going to run out and your wheat's not going to run out. You're going to be able to continue to make bread. So all of these miracles, a drought, bread and oil that, that never ends. It gets better than that. The widow's son dies. Elijah prays for the son. He comes back to life. Pretty amazing. And then Elijah encounters King Ahab again after three and a half years. And, and, and you've seen the scene. I could preach a whole sermon on this. We don't have time this morning, but I, you can't tell I'm excited about this, can you? I love this. I love this, and here's why, because we haven't got to chapter 19 yet. So 17 and 18 are talking about this amazing stuff that, that Elijah is witnessing because he's praying and God is moving. So he encounters this wicked king again, and what it what what happens? They're they're gonna have a they're gonna have like a spiritual dance off. So 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 the um, Ahab 
gets 450 prophets to Baal and 400 prophets to Asherah and gathers them together to go toe-to-toe with Elijah. We're talking 850 prophets to false gods and Elijah, who's representing the one true God. And you know the story, perhaps there, there's this, um, you know, the, the prophets of Baal, they're, they're calling out to their God to try to get the, the offering to, to burn up because the, 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 the way that they were going to know who the true God was is that they put together a sacrifice, but they weren't going to light it on fire. And it was going to be whoever's God consumed the sacrifice they knew was going to be the true God. The, 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 the prophets of Baal, they start screaming and ranting and yelling and praying and they're, all this stuff. And by noon, they're just getting frantic and they start cutting themselves with sword, which, by the way, is a sick. That's the very first evidence we ever have of cutting. Which is a horrible thing that inflicts some people in culture today. Where they somehow think that cutting is the answer. So, so they're, they're just going through all this and nothing happens. And then what, what happens? Elijah prays whew, after pouring water on the sacrifice, by the way. Fire comes from heaven and consumes the sacrifice. Some pretty epic stuff. Some pretty um, unbelievable stuff. And then what does he do? Elijah prays for rain and rain comes. And so this wicked king Ahab goes back to his wife Jezebel, who is a evil, manipulative woman in, in scripture. And, and, uh, and he says, Ahab, the wicked king, goes back and actually gives a testimony to God, says, God is with Elijah. And then what does Jezebel do? Jezebel sends word to Elijah, by this time tomorrow, I'm going to take you out. And then we get to chapter 19. Now, we have the luxury of reading back through all this. Elijah's living this out in real time. What is chapter 19 about? Elijah running for his life. Because one woman said, I'm going to kill you. Never mind the fact that Elijah just went toe-to-toe with hundreds upon hundreds of false prophets. Never mind the fact that he witnessed God intervene in the sacrifice. Never mind the fact that he witnessed this widow's son coming back to life. Never mind the fact that the oil and the bread never ran out. Never mind the fact that he prayed that it would rain after a drought, and it did. He saw God move after time, after time, after time. And yet what happens? He's exhausted, he's tired, and something hits him where he's weak, and he runs for his life. I was telling somebody this past week, like, I try to never make important decisions when I'm tired. Elijah was weary. He was physically weary. The next day, he just didn't have the faith that he had the day before. The next day, he didn't have the confidence in God that he had the day before when God brought fire down. That's why the author of James says, Elijah has a nature like you and I. So I love the fact that when we are told in Scripture that the prayers of a righteous person have power in them, and then he compares that righteous person to Elijah, it makes it so much more relatable. Because you know, you know that there are people in your mind that you have put on a spiritual pedestal. You know that there's people that you're like, oh, surely God's going to answer their prayer. They're full of faith all the time, right? Well, not necessarily. So God meets you in your humanity. Some days you are so full of faith and other days you are exhausted and you're like Elijah, you're running for your life and you're sitting under a tree just saying, God, I give up. Let Jezebel kill me. So what are we supposed to do? There's a call to prayer. We invite God into our situation. When we're on the mountaintop, when we're in the valley, we invite God in because there is power in prayer. 
and, 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 and we need to invite others in who are full of faith that can help, help us with their faith and pray for us and invite God into the situation. And lastly, I just want to talk about some practical, the practice of prayer. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We could probably do an entire sermon series on prayer. But I want to quickly jump to Matthew 6, and everybody knows this. If you've been a follower of Jesus for any amount of time, you probably know. This is one of the, the gospels um, uh, sharing of the Lord's Prayer. And it begins in verse 9. It says, Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So just real quickly, I want to just talk to you about some of the how-tos. How to practice prayer in a way that will, will, will grow you, I believe that will, will take you deeper in your prayer walk. There's some very practical things that you and I can do. And we see it mapped out here in the Lord's Prayer. And we also see it in James that we just read. Um, so the first thing that we see is God's, we need to pray according to God's will and we need to recognize his authority. So when, when you go to God, and you want him to move, it's really important, I think, that we go in the right, the right heart, the right atmosphere, the right... This week we were talking to somebody in our Rudy group, and they were talking about this, this antidote of... Um, you would never say to your best friend, you would never say to your spouse, uh, or, or tell somebody about talking to them and say, you know what? I, 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 talked to my, I talked to my spouse for 10 minutes this morning, so I'm good until tomorrow. You would never do that. That's not conversation. Yeah, I talked to my best friend yesterday. I'm thinking about talking to him day after tomorrow. And yet we sometimes do that to God. And, and, but, but when we come to God, even I think even more importantly than how often that we come to God, we need to come to God all the time, but even more importantly is how we come to God. So if you came to your spouse or your best friend always and you started out your conversation like this, hey, good morning, I need this and this and this and this. And the next day, hey, good to talk to you again. I need this, this, and this, and this. You still haven't done this. And then the next day, did I mention yesterday that I needed this and this? Because I thought I did. And the next day, I need this and this and this. You would never start your conversation out like that with anybody that you love much less the God of the universe. So the Lord's Prayer shows us, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That's awesome. <laughs> He's saying amen. That's his way of saying amen, right? What is that doing? It's simply recognizing the authority of God. You are in charge. Your kingdom. That refers to his authority, your will. So when you pray, just a practical tip, and I know you probably know this, but I just want to encourage you. Start out with, start out with that. Recognize his authority. Not just his authority over you, but his authority over your situation. Secondly, um, forgiveness is a really big, important thing here. And again, I'm not trying to wow you with a bunch of prayer tips here but I just want to talk to you about some practical things that we better be incorporating in our life if we want a vibrant prayer life. And forgiveness is really, really important. We see it in the Lord's Prayer. We see it. There is a ask for forgiveness. It says, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Forgiveness is very, very important when you come to pray in prayer. It, you, forgiveness for your own shortcomings sins, but then also not harboring for, uh, bitterness against somebody else and forgiving other people. And we see that it, in James, we just read it. It says, um, therefore conf confess your sins to one another and pray for one another 
So we see this interplay in James. We see this interaction in the Lord's Prayer, the importance of forgiveness, that we ask for forgiveness and we extend forgiveness. Now, I'm just going to say something right now. I believe that sometimes our prayers are hindered when we don't forgive people. I believe scripture shows us that when we don't forgive others in the same way God has forgiven us, we, a couple of weeks ago in Colossians, we saw that. We were, were to extend grace to others as grace has been extended to us. I believe our prayers can be hindered because in the Lord's Prayer it says, forgive my debts as I've forgiven others. You want your prayers to be more effective? Make sure that you're forgiving other people. I believe our prayers are hindered because we don't extend forgiveness to other people and I believe that sometimes our prayers are hindered because we don't ask God to forgive us. We dive right into praying to God about all of our needs and we kind of like take this area of our life that maybe has unconfessed sin and we just kind of like move it over into the parking lot. I'm not going to talk about that right now, God. But by the way, can you please move on my behalf over here? So again, I'm, these are just some practical things that you should try to incorporate that are very scriptural. Recognize the authority of God. Make sure that you are asking forgiveness and you're extending forgiveness. There's another thing. Um, thanksgiving and praise. And if you'll go with me to Psalm 100, and this is something that Karen and I put into practice all the time. And I'm going to ask the worship team to go ahead and come up here as we close. Psalm 100 and verse 4. It says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Now we just read in James chapter 5 that it says, if you're suffering, pray. If you're cheerful, give praise. There's this interplay, this interaction where praise and thanksgiving should be a part of my daily conversation with God. And this is one of my favorite verses. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And let me tell you what Karen and I try to do. We, we pray together every morning and, and um, it's, you know, it's not like we're super spiritual, but we've just learned that we need to invite God into our day every single day. And we do that together. And I don't always do this. Sometimes I catch myself not doing it and I have to like check myself and back up. But as Karen and I enter into prayer, we always start by thanking God for who he is and what he has done. And praising him. And let me tell you something, just from a very practical standpoint, you need more faith in your prayer. You, you, you're longing for your, your faith to be encouraged. I promise you, if you start your prayers by thanking God for everything he has done for you, by the time you get to your list of needs that you want him to move on, you're going to be so full of faith because you are reminded of the greatness of God. You see, we could start by praying, God, I, I pray, when this is a noble prayer, it's a good prayer, God, I pray that we can meet inside again, that we could start. Or I can start by praying, God, I am so grateful that we have a place to meet. I'm so grateful that we have the opportunity to gather. I am so grateful for technology who, who, who makes people who are in their living rooms right now feel a part of what you're doing here. God, I'm so grateful that you have moved. I am so grateful of the ways that you've provided for us in the past. God, thank you Thank you for the people in my life. God, thank you for the heritage that I have. Thank you for the home that I grew up in. Thank you for uh, my job. It, it may be really, really difficult right now, but let's start by thanking him. 
And so there's this idea of entering into his courts with thanksgiving and, and entering with praise. And that is actually a picture of the temple in the Old Testament where there was this, this court system, this outer court. And this high idea the psalmist is saying, I'm entering in the outer part. Before I even get inside to that intimate place, that place where I'm really speaking to God, before I even get there, I'm starting the conversation as I'm walking through the gates with praise and thanksgiving. God, I worship you. You're awesome. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for my health today. Thank you for my job, even though it's really getting me down. I thank you for provision. I thank you for, for the breath in my lungs. I thank you for the cool air. I thank you. Just start thanking God. Thanking God. Thank him. Praise him. Recognize his authority. Make sure there's no unforgiveness in you. Make sure you're asking forgiveness. I promise you, if you start putting those things into practice, you may have some days like Elijah where he was on the run and you're feeling like you're on the run, but you're also going to have some days like Elijah where you're stepping forward in boldness and you're saying, God, I know you're going to move. I know you're going to move and you're going to sit back and you're going to watch God move because his word is true. And it says that, his, that, that prayer has power in it. So we're going to conclude with worship right now. And I just want to encourage you that as we're, as we're singing and as we're praising, I just want to encourage you to start thinking about what it would look like to incorporate praise in your prayer. And that praise and prayer would be intertwined and that faith would rise up within you and you would start to see the power of God move on your behalf. So let's do that right now. If you'll stand, let's stand and worship prayerfully with an attitude of praise. <laughs>